Hi everyone, this is Desmond Marshall here from Hoosh International. I'm just going to answer back some of the questions from the audience from my previous webinar with uh, Shinhai Futures Lab, how to navigate businesses through crisis. So there are a couple of questions that they like to ask me. So I'll try to answer them around here. Okay, this one's from uh, Huyin Vu. Okay, um, what do you think about the changes of banking industry after the pandemic or in the new future? Right, okay, that's a great question actually. Now, the the whole banking industry right now is really going into a really different area because even before the pandemic, the, the COVID uh, virus, people are talking about uh, virtual banking already. So right now we're seeing two sides of the, the coin. So one of it is traditional banks and the other one will be very non-traditional banks like virtual banking, where they do not have any retail shops or any locations uh, whatsoever. Everything's done online. Now, in, for certain countries, of course, this might be something that's um, a game changer mainly because the the normal banks, uh, the big ones, uh, well, pretty much many of the banks are, are big anyway. So they, they are really reliant on having locations, um, actual locations, uh, people can line up, um, whether they're the, the young people or the old people, they can line up and it's a very cash-based uh, society as well. And that's the reason why they need a lot of um, branches and uh, and all the and the manpower, uh, the people power as well. So right now, because of this coronavirus, people aren't coming out. Uh, the banks are being closed, uh, shut down temporarily or right now permanently. Uh, and many banks, especially the overseas banks, they do not have enough uh, clients coming in anymore. And there's going to be a likely of uh, some certain banks from overseas where they can only do commercial banking um, in uh, other countries, in foreign countries, they will have to close shop uh, and really have to migrate a lot of stuff over to online. So from what I'm saying right now is, uh, on the other hand, of course, the traditional banks are having a awakening call right now, uh, which means that uh, they realize um, having location branches and the old process, uh, there are a lot of like, even for some of the bigger uh, banks like HSBC and, and all these banks around here, they still use paper and pen. So for us, I've experienced this myself uh, and I do not like it at all. So you, if you want to change something, say for example, the limit of, uh, of a transaction or on you know, e-banking, e you actually have to fill out a, a big form, which consists of like 40 pages. Printing is a pain. Filling it is also a big pain as well, because if you mess up with just one, 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 one section, or, or one area and, and you just tick the wrong checkbox, uh, what, just one checkbox, and your whole form is invalid anymore and you have to start all over again. So this is quite a pain for, especially for business people and for doing businesses, especially these days. So I'm seeing um, banks, if they don't change, they're gonna have a big problem right now. So take a look at HSBC, they're having big problems uh, because they're big, uh, they, they hire too many people, they're still using a lot of uh, old legacy systems, uh, old legacy processes around here, which is understandable. But in a way, uh, there's going to be a lot of new competition coming in, especially from the virtual banks. So I, for myself, I'm looking forward to the virtual banks, uh, mainly because I don't need to print out the forms and actually go down and waste my time lining up in a branch. So in a way, I think that this is something that's gonna change uh, and virtual banks will definitely have a upper hand because they started out as virtual online instead of what the others are doing is uh, they adopt online at a later stage. So that's the, the answer. I hope that answers it. So next question, I'm working in the education industry. Please give advice on what do you see? How is the picture of education in the future after COVID? Well, like I said, it's all gonna change a lot, especially, well, pretty much everyone. 
every industry. So education industry, um, schools are closed. Um, so when we talk about education industry, it's not just for uh, universities or colleges, secondary schools or primary schools. We're also talking about like um, leisure hobbies kind of education as well. So taking your kid to go learn swimming, that's part of it as well. That's hobbies, leisures, uh, drawing classes, or we also talk about like nurseries as well. So uh, kids, small kids, babies, nurseries, uh, kindergartens at the same time. So all these things are being affected because the kids cannot go out and the parents are afraid of being infected as well. Um, so, it, so in a way, like I said, in many of the discussions that we had with you guys and with other people as well, um, going online is definitely the thing to do. Um, some of the educational institutes um, have already done so as well. It's just a matter of different degrees. So they have online courses already. Um, they have a combination of offline and online courses where uh, there's only one teacher uh, sitting in a room with 40 people. But what if there's like 60 or 100 or even 1,000 people, say, for example, like in China. So everything has to be relied pretty much on, in, on, on online. So having that experience, having that thing that's, that's long in the works already. So if you're not doing it, then you're actually much more slower than the general public outside so um, this this is something if, if you're still relying on um face to face and all that uh it's going to be very difficult so my suggestion uh, and it also goes down down to you can also actually look into as a reference for yoga teachers uh physical training teachers they're also teaching as well so conceptually they're pretty much the same so what they're doing is actually hey let's go online let's have uh courses uh online courses where people can subscribe uh, of course you can have a face-to-face -face kind of thing as well as, uh, so it actually hampers a little bit but then again if you're stuck at home what's going to happen so in a way, these are things that you have to take a look and also get prepared. Uh, and it's also a good thing as well, because one of the key things that we look into in terms of education is you only have, say for example, your teacher. You're only one person. So yes, you're selling your knowledge, you're selling your experience, and that's pretty much it. If you're talking to one person, you're getting money from one person only, one student only. If you are meeting people in a group conference, or in a, in a classroom, probably 30 people, great. That's that's face-to-face -face that you can do. But what if you, you and, but the thing is you only have 24 hours per day. You can't just indefinitely do this and not sleep at all because no students will sleep anyway. So in a way you have to think about, okay, what are you gonna do? Just like investments, what are you gonna do when you're sleeping? Can you train the trainer? Uh, you have deputies, you have uh, assistant trainers that they can actually train the people who are not paying enough. So you have different tiers of uh, payment system. So if you're paying a lot more, yes, you're like, hey, you can actually meet Warren Buffet for a one-to-one -one meeting. But if you're not paying enough, so just go on online and, and look at their master classes or, or whatever. Uh, but if you're doing online live, how can you do that live streaming as well? People do this all the time already. It's nothing new. If you think this is new, well, you've got a real big problem. Uh, you have to open your eyes up to the, to the real world. So um, the thing is, it's got to stay forever. Uh, and of course, in terms of the education, um, there's going to be a lot of different changes where in terms of one of the things is how you can bring the experience from offline to uh, someone else's location uh, or even online. So let me give you an example. Uh, music, music schools uh, playing piano. So right now because of the coronavirus, uh, the shops, the, the classrooms have been shut down. Kids, uh, students cannot go to the actual music room. So what do you do? So people, what people do is pretty ingenious is they hire a truck and they put the piano in the truck uh, refurbish the inside to make it look nice inside the truck and they drive to the student's location so nearby below the streets downstairs uh nearby in the, in the park so that when the when the students are ready they just come down walk a short distance go inside the truck 
close it and hey, let's keep the environment clean and then you can actually have the one-on-one -on -one already. So, so these are something that you can think about. Um, whether it works or not, it really depends on how, how much of your, your investments are and also the costings and everything. So you've got to be careful with that as well. Okay, so thank you for this question. So the next one is, um, as an investor, can you share some insights about how this coronavirus impact the real estate industry? And if there is any advice for investment, what should it be? So thanks so much. Uh, thank you. I guess that you are a that you you're someone who is interested in the property real estate area, and you're seeing well right now the the prices everything is is plummeting down in terms of the pricing. So you're thinking about hey, should I buy something, buy a property uh, when it's at a, it's uh, when it's at a low price currently. Now, I don't know where you're from. I guess you're from um, uh, Vietnam, from your name. Um, so well, I'm also personally interested in Vietnam properties as well. So in a way, um, the only thing I can tell you is um, if you're investing anything, do a homework first. So you can be a speculator, but you have to be very good at it and you have to be very lucky at it as well because look at how the oil prices are these days, uh, just suddenly plummeting within 20 minutes from like, um, from a positive uh, point price point to a negative price point. So it actually killed a lot of people. Uh, and also it's affecting still the general politics uh, worldwide as well. So if you are, and even this dumped a lot of like so-called experts or any economists, uh, all the all the key experts around here. So so people are burnt, even the, the, the keen experts, the ones that, that have been uh, winning money for a long time, they're, they're really burned bad this time. So you can actually see that um, there, there's nothing for certain. So the only thing I can say is uh, if there's if you're talking about investments, there's there's going to be like up the ups and downs going up and down. So you can win and you can lose as well at the same time, just like a casino. So if you're going in, learn your basics. Learn. Uh, you can speculate, but you need to you need to be very careful in terms of the timing, and also you need to have a lot of uh, capital as well in order to make short-term gains. So if you're just a normal person like you and I, uh, in that case, do your homework first. Uh, yes, property is something that's uh, very keen for a lot of Asians, uh, but of course, is this the right time? I wouldn't say so. I'm just looking at it right now at, at this point around here. And, um, and there's also um, things that's gonna happen by the government. Suddenly the government may announce certain things and you never know uh, the change of policy for taxation and how, who, uh, who can own a property and all these things will, will come in place. So you have to be prepared for change like this. So it's, it's something, yes, it's uh, I think in a way property is a good investment, especially in Asia. But however, you, I don't know your situation. I don't know what you're looking at, commercial residential in Vietnam, outside of Vietnam. I don't know. Uh, there are other people looking at other places as well. So there's always low prices, but if it's low price, um, why is it low price in the first place? So you got to be careful with all these things coming along here. So hope you win. Uh, if you do, let me know. I'm interested in that as well. <laughs> okay, next question. This is interesting. Uh, from Bao Chang Nong Lei, when market price is less than the average variable cost of production, should a business choose to shut down in the short run or should it try to innovate the business and keep operating? Now that's very interesting. Um, from that, I can think that uh, you're probably a, um, a boss, a owner of, um, of something in terms of manufacturing as well, so uh, tangible products. So the question is, if I'm making this product for ten dollars, uh, and when the, and and of course, if you're selling for it, it should be like fifty dollars or even more, if you like. It shouldn't be going down to less. So, but then again, the the market is something that is driving what's happening outside. So you're saying, hey, the market price might be outside right now, might be five dollars only, and you're actually making a loss. 
Should you stop the business or should you continue uh, to do something and innovate? Now, my point is pretty simple sometimes. Um, I will always say always innovate, but it really depends on how, how you see things. Uh, I don't know what your product is. If your product is a pineapple, then it's a totally different thing than if you're selling an, an iPhone, uh, something that does not deteriorate over time. So a pineapple deteriorates over time like fairly quickly, which means that if you have to store it, then you have to have like um, air condition storage. Uh, you have to have a large storage as well that takes up space, which means money. And you have to do it fairly quickly because it's gonna decay and there's gonna be like bugs uh, eating on it, chewing on it, and it's gonna smell like hell. So, uh, but of course, if you're selling like mobile phones, yes, it doesn't really decay. Um, it can stay on forever uh, in, in theory. But of course, you need to think about, hey, uh, after two months or three months of IT advancements, will your phone still be technologically competitive as compared to new phones coming out outside? So I'm just using this as a comparison. So, so in a way, if for uh, it's very different as well if you are selling, let's say, for example, like fruit juice, for example. So in, in that case, it's, it's pretty different in terms of how you do things. So uh, from my end, it's um, if you're sitting there and not doing anything, then it's a waste of time because you're still investing in money, but it's just that you're investing in something else. So for example, storage. So which is no good as well because this is what we call sunk cost. So, and sunk cost means that there is no value in return. Uh, it's gone forever. So try to avoid that as much as you can. Uh, and I also from an investor point of view and from even from a business point of view, cash flow is pretty important as well. So uh, for certain cases, even if you're making a loss, well, at the very least, you're getting cash flow back. And yes, on paper, you might be making a loss, but in reality, you're still getting back your cash back. So even with $5, you can use that $5 to invest in something else. But if you don't, then which means that you're actually investing more to store what you have already. So you might have, the, the sunk cost is $10. But if you store it, then you probably have another 2 or $3 as an extra sunk cost, which means you're losing $12 or even $15. But if you're getting something back in return like $5, yes, in paper, you're losing, making making a loss, but in cash flow wise, you're you're getting something out of cash flow, and you can start to think about pivoting, uh, doing something different, uh, or something that's totally, or totally, uh, or even closing down the shop as well. So that that's another option uh, at this point around here. So from my side, I would always think about, um, well, the thing is, should you keep on doing what you're doing or innovate something else? I would always say innovate because if it's so bad outside, then you have to balance it out and say, hey, um, should I keep selling this at a loss? And at the same time, finding new ways of innovating and make um, and try to break even from other areas to make more money uh, just to cover up my losses. So. I would always say just be proactive, don't be reactive uh, and innovate. So if you're selling pineapples, if I would be, uh, well, if I'm selling pineapples in the first place uh, as a farmer, I won't be selling pineapples anymore. I will be upgrading myself. I, we talk to a lot of farmers. We talk to, we, we talk to uh, different sustainable innovation companies and, and farms. We have farms as well. So we, we talk to a lot of different farmers too. So, so in a way, uh, hey, you might be producing pineapples, but if I say, hey, let's switch it to fruit juice, okay? So pineapple juice, and I brand it as, hey, this is a healthy fruit juice. It will boost your immune system. So I call it immune boost pineapple. Sounds good, right? Well, that's a lot of people. That's what a lot of people have done already anyway. So it's nothing new. It's just a matter of how you change and switch it all over to something new. Uh, and from there on, you can add in a little bit of thing, add in yogurt, add in strawberries, add in a piece of lint over there, plate it nicely, put it in a nice cup, uh, just like what they do in Four Seasons Hotel or in the high-end luxury hotels as well. You're eating the same spaghetti, but if you put it in a nice plate, then you can charge like two times or three times more. And in such sense, 
you don't have to care about what's happening in the outside world, what the market is doing, because the market, if you're comparing to the 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 the, the, um, the, the ones who are just cutting their costs and then the the low entry point barriers, uh, the low entry uh, players, they will only talk about just the the lowest price, and they will just do price wars and all that stuff. That is useless for uh, a, a normal business. Uh, I, I never recommend that unless it's really necessary. So in a way, um, change it, pivot to something new. Uh, maybe it's something that will actually boost it up. And it's good because you can say, hey, from farm to your immune system, you're actually providing the whole suite of solutions to everyone. So it's just a matter of how, how you package it. Uh, you might be able to do online delivery and then say, hey, if you're sick, you should have the immune boost pineapple juice, for example. I hope that gives you some ideas in terms of how you can pivot. So next question. Do you think more investment in online advertising is a good way to sell products these days? That's also a very good question. Um, when people say online advertising, well, online advertising spans quite wide. So from one end, the traditional at the very beginning end is the banner ads uh, or the advertorials, uh, but mainly everyone can see it's an, it's an ad uh, on the website or in an email. So that is something that is, well, it's for a small business or a medium business or even big businesses around here. We've been doing this, we've been looking at this for more than 20, 20 years. Um, I've been the e-commerce or, or the internet guy like 25 years ago. And I've seen how these things have changed. And so far, the banner ads, they don't really work. If you're trying to get some Google banner ads, uh, Google uh, AdSense, uh, getting some money out of it, you either will need to have like a massive traffic uh, or you're going to have like really, really good content coming out. And most of the time, you do not have those two things. And getting money from these banner ads, it's, uh, it's not going to work anything else because how often, I'm asking all the question back to you, to you is, how often do you click on a banner ad? Pretty much like never or once in like 10 years. So it's not really a good thing. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there are new forms of advertising coming up online or, uh, or electronically. So there's apps, there's, uh, there's TikTok, there's uh, YouTube, there's different things coming along here. There's influencers, KOLs, as we call it in Asia. Uh, there's also different forms of uh, advertising or promotion, as we can say. So even webinars is also another way of promoting. Uh, so there are different forms of marketing, as we call them. So uh, if you're talking about, should we put in more money in terms of online advertising for banner ads? Well, I mean, first things, if the company is telling me, hey, I'm putting in a lot of money into banner ads, I will pretty much be really pissed off um, because it's not a really good way of using money. Uh, but if you're saying, hey, we're putting the money and we're doing um, different forms of e or online electronic marketing, online and offline, then that's a combination that you should be doing it. And of course, there's a lot of people, like I said, uh, with the six consumer trends right now, people are sitting in front of the screens more often. So, and especially, it's not just the PC, uh, but also in front of the, the handphones. How are you going to leverage that uh, on the handphone? Um, do you want pop-up ads, which is pretty annoying? Or do you want to advertise in a WhatsApp group? or even in Facebook Messenger or something else. So there are different forms of so-called uh, advertising or to better put it, you should call it online marketing. So in a way, I would put more emphasis on the new forms of marketing, say for example, like videos, say for example, not even KOL. So it's probably like videos uh, or, or different forms of uh, how you target your own audience and, and just make sure the, the same thing as well. Uh, it's a good analogy I normally use. If you're looking for a girlfriend, don't go to the men's toilet. So, because there's no woman inside. 
So you're looking at the wrong place. So if you want to sell to your potential clients, for example, you're trying to sell to students, go to where the students go. So if they're going to TikTok, go to TikTok. If they're going to YouTube, go to YouTube. If they're doing something else or if they're doing Snapchat or whatever, go to Snapchat. If they don't go to WhatsApp, do not advertise in WhatsApp. It is that simple. So I hope that helps for you. Great. Okay, let me just have a sip. Next question is Tao Nguyen. How will this pandemic impact the art industry? How should creators or art investors change to adapt to the current situation? Well, good question as well. Um, there's a, a big art fair each year in Asia or around the world called Art Basel. So Art Basel just announced that they're doing virtual, well, curating or virtual uh, exhibition of the art pieces. Um, but basically, it de depends on how you execute these things. So yes, you, ev everyone has been doing it already. So you go to an online shop, you go to Sotheby's or you go to Christie's, it's online already. So you can actually see the actual picture uh, if you're buying a painting. You can actually see photos of the installation art as well online already. So it's been done. It's, it's nothing new. So what's a little bit new is how you talk to your customers. So if you're in the art industry, um, the same thing goes, change or die. If you don't, then it's a big problem because uh, there will be people uh, looking at art pieces. There will be people, of course, there, there will be less uh, and you have to be very careful in terms of who you're talking to anymore because uh, your your old or your existing clients or your or the art appreciators or investors they may not be interested in your art anymore. So um, in the old days they have a hundred dollars they can invest in a hundred pieces of art. Right now their their investments or their or their net worth has actually shrunk a lot. So they now only have fifty dollars. So. 50 people or 50 art or artists will go hungry from here on. So you just have to be very careful. Of course, if um, if you're looking at things, simple things like if you're looking, if you're selling a painting, of course, it's much more easier than selling uh, a nice, a, a big installation art. So you just have to be careful in terms of, uh, okay, it actually gives you much more room right now these days because you can do the same thing because art, you just snap a few photos. If it's a 2D art, you just snap a few photos, close, uh, closing in uh, for, for a near detail shot. Uh, you're just selling a product, pretty much it. So people will be looking at and probably making a decision pretty quickly, just like what people do in silent auctions or phone auctions and stuff like that. Uh, they don't need to see the real thing as long as they know what it is. But of course, you, you can't compare yourself to a Van Gogh. So do not do that uh, at all. But if you're in an installation art, if you're a big art, and if you're in the interactive contemporary art, that's a big problem because uh, especially for interactive ones, you might need the client to touch it. So what do you do? The only thing is right now is uh, online, uh, online videos. You can do things like live streaming and you can do one-on-one -on -one streaming because we're talking about art, uh, you, you, you just have to do it in a much more private manner online. So private viewings and say, hey, okay, there's um, there's this family around here. So two members or three members, you go online and then I'll show you around the piece and live uh, with my phone or with a good camera, if you invest in a good camera and you can show them pretty much uh, in a different manner, which is actually better than actually putting an exhibition and people will actually say, hey, uh, I'm just strolling by and you're wasting time talking like 50 minutes or so and the guy just say, okay, whatever, I'm not even interested and they walk away. If you have a private viewing, uh, like in a private chat, like in uh, WhatsApp, a private video conferencing call, you, uh, the people will be difficult and say, okay, fine, I'm, I'm not looking at this. I want to look at something else, okay? So if they're not interested, of course, they say, I'm not interested, but they won't go on to a call with you if they're not interested. So which means that you should, if you play this right, you should have more game time, FaceTime, personal time, actually personal time 
with these potential investors, which is actually a good thing because you don't have to travel, you don't have to deliver or ship uh, or move your big installation from point A to point B. So you're spending a lot less time, spending a lot less money for delivery costs uh, and also the fear of breaking your installation art. Uh, I look into glass art as well. Uh, I, I like I like glass as well. And it's always it's a scary nightmare when I, I see people shipping and moving glass uh, back and forth. Uh, anything can happen. So so leverage on that. Uh, do on you have to do online. So online is pretty much like a standard answer. It's just a matter of how do you make it more personal. How can you make that experience as a, as compared to if I'm walking in a big exhibition where there's tons of people, a lot of art, art around, I'm just looking at it like for 20 seconds. How can I enhance that experience when I'm actually uh, reserving a time with you privately and you take me through the whole, uh, whole look of your installation and your explanation? Because you will have more explanation time in front of the people so to actually explain uh, the the concept and your ideologies behind that art uh, and I'm sure from an artist's point of view this is very much appreciated and, and very needed as well because if you meet someone who appreciates art as well they will listen and they will spend more time listening and which is good because hey they're stuck in front of the computer so what do they do uh, instead of looking at cat videos probably look at uh, and talk to you face to face and understand what your story is you actually have a lot more face time from there on. And from there, you act, you can feel if that investor is really interested or not. And then, hey, this is a real uh, art appreciator, which means that you you should, if you play this right, you should get much more better customers coming out from this as well, uh, which will be much more longer term customers than just just like uh, a normal Joe or normal guy, lady walking down a big exhibition and they're just doing their, just to take nice photos and then posting on Instagram. And, and that doesn't really help in, in the actual conversion for revenue for your site. So this is something that you should be looking into and, uh, and good luck on this as well. Okay, the last question will be from Tony Ngo. Do you think a seafood farmer and manufacturer with high standard certifications and good reputation in global markets can still raise funds this time? That is a good question. So we deal with a lot of sustainable innovations, uh, uh, especially with farm tech, uh, marine farm tech as well, and food tech as well as well. So one of the things that um, it's, it's a given, it's a guarantee is that Traditional farming will not more work anymore because traditional farming, we're talking about really traditional farming. So old stubborn people will not work anymore. So right now, the, the days right now is people are more systematic. They look into uh, high tech. Uh, they, they want guaranteed uh, positive, consistent results. But if you're looking into the old style of farming, like traditional, hey, the, the farmer looks in, looks up to the sky and, um, and, and probably like um, look at how, how, how the temperature uh, is the water with his own bare hands. That does not work anymore because climate change. The world has changed dramatically and climate change is serious already which means that there are different places where normally during certain months you will have rain now there's no rain it's dried up so the the weather it's wonky it's crazy it's un unpredictable so your old historical experience will not work anymore um, or will not work as you see fit anymore so you're you're losing much more uh, you're, you're betting on it. So in the old days, you're still betting on it, uh, betting on good weather and stuff like that. So probably your success rate is 80% back in the old days. But right now, because of climate change, your success rate might drop down to 50%. So especially with seafood, algae, I don't know if you are offshore or onshore farming. So those are two different, very different variables outside. So of course, if you're if you're uh, uh, onshore, uh, which means that uh, if you're offshore, which is in the sea, 
uh, which means that you you'll be susceptible to algae, uh, climate change, weather predators, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and and that's really no good uh, from this end around here. So the the thing I normally tell people is uh, you've got to go high tech. So agri tech, um, marine farm tech, 2.0, 3.0. We're doing that already. We're introducing new uh, innovations and technology down to the traditional farms to just convert them. And you see right now. The big clients right now these days, I don't care whether they are investors or big clients like um, the, the hotel groups like Marriott, uh, the Hilton groups, uh, or even bigger farms where they are food farms uh, or food, uh, food processors, uh, food companies, they will need consistent results because they will need to keep the costing good. They will need to satisfy their customers uh, appropriately. You can't tell the Four Seasons Hotel or the Hilton or the Intercontinental where they charge their clients $400 US per plate of salad and you just give them, hey, there's holes in my vegetables. Um, and you, I'm paying you $400 and you're telling me you're out of stock. These are things that uh, the, the hotel leaders or the customers, uh, they will not allow. So if you're the supplier, then how do you make sure there's the good quality and consistencies of all, uh, and all that going along here? So yes, standards, certifications, processes, uh, good reputation. To me, these are basic stuff. These are basic requirements. So um, it's really like, um, well, this is something that's normal basic. So tell me more that you can actually attract more investments coming in. Because investors right now these days are pretty demanding because clients right now these days are very demanding. Look at how the coronavirus is doing to everyone. Everyone is more health conscious. Everyone is looking into, is going to look into, is looking already into food tech already. So they're talking about, hey, um, if we can't supply this because of a lockdown, all the supplies are not going in and now import and exports are all messed up right now. So people are more concerned about, oh, how can I grow things in a more sustainable way, healthier way, uh, safer way uh, to, to my consumers or to myself. So these are things that you have to think about as well. So the things in terms of like not using antibodies, antibiotics uh, and all these chemicals around here, using something organic, uh, using natural ways, uh, less invasive kind of methods. There are things outside going along here. So, but what you're saying, if you're just doing some normal standards, like what most traditional companies are doing, uh, even for the big companies that they're traditional, that they're doing like, hey, uh, let's have a nice process or whatever. And if you're not improving, then I can pretty much tell you they, if they don't change, they will die as well. They will die off as well because we don't want that anymore. So the old process, because of the coronavirus, the lockdown, they may need a lot of people. They may need people to actually go to the factories. Well, a good example is yesterday, Tyson and also Smithfield, because of the, the pork, uh, uh, because of the workers, they had a serious outbreak. A few hundred people ha had an outbreak in the factories over there. So they had to actually shut down their, their, their factories. And it's a big serious case because it's a, it's a massive outbreak in a small area. And also they have to handle a lot of pork and also meat from these factories. So which means that the, the supply is going to dwindle down and people are concerned. Uh, and of course, the brands, the, the companies themselves, the brands, it's tarnished already. So, so how can you actually save that back? It's going to take a long time. It's going to take a, a lot of money and different ways of doing so. Um, but of course, if you're just doing normal stuff, you have to think about all these things in terms of what's going to happen uh, later on because of this. You're effective already. You have to think about new ways of innovation. You have to think about just like people working in the office. If you can't meet up, if you can't have workers going to the office or to the factories, you have to think about remotely. So can you do things remotely? Can you have robots doing things remotely? Automatic feeders, can you do that remotely? There are automatic feeders already with Wi-Fi connection and everything. You can actually look at it. It's nothing new. It's, it's the, the only new thing is you have to change it. So if you're not improving, if you're not innovative enough, new investors will not be interested in your company because we know that you will die uh, eventually.
So that's that's the whole point. You even for the big companies, even if you have a trawler or whatever, if you don't change, then well goodbye. So so you, so you can't go to the next level. You can't jump up to the next level. You'll always be like a mass producer, and mass producers they only have one thing left to tell people is cutting down the cost and which is good because I, you can challenge me and I can pretty much challenge anyone with pure confidence that your profit margins are going down every second by the year. So if you're doing traditional mass productions or manufacturing, if you don't improve, your profit margins are going down every year, every second. So eventually it's going down to a point where you can't even break even. So the thing is most people or some of the companies, they have to change, they have to build their own brands, they have to change different ways of reducing labor, reducing taxation, uh, making it much more efficient, uh, making it much more safer for people so that you can use this as an extra ammunition, marketing ammunition to tell people that, hey, this is something that's, that's good for your health. It's nothing um, bad, bad to your to your system. Help help you to uh, boost up your immune system. So I hope that helps. Uh, if you have any questions on this area as well, we're also looking into uh, marine farms who can also work together with us, partner with us as an innovative in, in, in site uh, in, under our accelerator program. We will introduce new technologies free of charge. To your company just to test things out and to make you better so if you're a farmer uh, i don't care whether it's a soil farm whether you're a marine farmer uh you just let me know and uh you, you just go to my linkedin type in desmond marshall and you can find me and uh, uh or we're posting it out on social media just post anything on the comments as well we, this is something that i'm also interested in as well so if for other people, if you're also interested or if you need more help, of course, you let me know. Uh, we have the the one-on-one -on -one exercise program. So hoochvc.com slash one-on-one. -on -one -on -one. I'll post the, the links as well. Uh, if not, just to find it out. So hopefully this Q&A session is useful for you. And I hope everyone good health, stay healthy. And uh, yes, it's gonna be difficult these days, but it's a good opportunity, like I said, to actually expand into something different, something you haven't tried before. And the good thing is the big companies can't touch you right now because the smaller companies or the medium companies can actually grow much more quicker and faster and move much more agile uh, in this sense as well. So thank you very much and, and goodbye, good luck.